Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about magic. Isn't it magical? <laughs> We will be talking about our video from last Halloween. So happy Halloween, everyone. Woo oh, actually, I mean, woo. <laughs> and so we're going to be talking about the video we put out last year for Halloween, which was on the topic of magic. And we'll get to that in a moment. We will also have a video out for Halloween this year, but maybe not on Halloween. I mean, it remains to be seen, but... <laughs> we're recording this... Four days before Halloween? And I'm still writing the script. Let's just say it might need a little bit of magic. <laughs> so if it has not already come out as of Halloween, um, expect a video that is surprisingly retro and Halloween themed sometime in November. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to find Hermione and borrow her time turner. Yeah, we need about 18 more days in every day. <laughs> before we turn to that, though, a couple of things. First of all, we've just come back from, well, a little while ago, we came back from Sound Education, which we mentioned uh, was the educational podcasting conference that we were at in Boston. And we had a fabulous time. Mm -hmm. it was really amazing. Lots of people that we had known online, but got to meet in person, <laughs> which is always really, really mm -hmm. lovely. Very inspiring and mm -hmm. energizing. Mm -hmm. And I think we learned some actual things too. Yeah, I came came away with a number of um, you know actionable. Mm -hmm. Actionable. I mean, we haven't actually we haven't taken acted, any actions se, because yes. that would no, take but some good ideas. So yeah, no, that yeah. was helpful. We did record an episode while we were there. We talked to Scott Lepisto of the Itinera podcast. However, we wanted to put out this Halloween episode first, so that episode will be coming out next. It will be coming out in November. Uh, our discussion with Scott, um, which is about the com we talk about the conference, we talk about podcasting, we talk about classics. Mm -hmm. So look forward to that. In the meantime, we should turn. I think we don't have anything else to no, talk about. I don't think there's any other news. So we should turn to our cocktails because it's been a while since we've actually had a cocktail on a podcast. <laughs> because it's been a while since we've not been doing an interview. interview right? That's <laughs> really. true. So today we are drinking a very simple cocktail. It's called a Black Magic. This would be more impressive if you could see it. Well, I have perhaps. taken a picture and I have put it up. <laughs> if you go to the website, you can see the picture. It is pretty cool looking. It is very, very cool looking. Because what it is, it's a very simple drink. Um, it's just vodka and lime juice and sh simple syrup, or in my case, I just used Rose's Lime. But what vodka? Why? I'm so glad you asked, Mark. Because it is a black vodka. Ooh. A vodka. This one with minerals in it, I think, not charcoal, mm. which mm. some black vodka is done with charcoal. Uh, this is got some sort of minerals in it, I think. And so it's black. Mm -hmm. And... If I do say so myself, I also did some pretty spectacular uh, garnishing. That's right. <laughs> it is. Uh, the, the glasses are rimmed with purple sugar sprinkles, I guess, right? Those aren't actually sugar sprinkles. They're no. a weird sort of cake decorating thing that's sort of... They're just glisteny things. They'll kind of evaporate when you drink them and they, they're not, they're they're not, not sweet. sweet. Oh. No, they're, they're sort of shimmery thing. They look almost like they're plastic, but they're not, obviously. <laughs> so, cheers. Cheers. Mm. And they do kind of stick to the mouth, mm. but that's okay. But yeah, they're, they're basically tasteless. Mm -hmm. mm. But they're cool and purpley. Oh, and the drink is just, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a vodka gimlet, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's tasty enough. Yeah, it doesn't taste how it looks. Mm -mm. Which is very disconcerting. Magical. <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying that. All right. Well, I suppose we should just turn to the voiceover from last year's video, which is quite long. So we will go through that and then we will try to pick up on some things, expand on some points that we yeah. made, but without going into too, too much detail because we don't want this to be a two and a half hour <laughs> podcast. Do we, Mark? Ah. Do we, Mark? <laughs> Want is a strong term. Mm, you know I do the editing, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back at you in a moment.
The word magic had a long way to travel before making it into English. The earliest citations for the word in the Oxford English Dictionary are in the Middle English of Geoffrey Chaucer. The word was borrowed through French and Latin, ultimately from Greek, where it got its adjective form magikos. But the root of this word wasn't originally Greek. The Greek noun magos comes from an old Iranian word magush, probably through Old Persian from Old Median. The Greek noun magos makes it into English too, as the word mage, and in the plural form magi, which is probably mainly known from the three magi visiting the baby Jesus in the nativity story. Ultimately the word can be traced back to Proto-Indo-European mag, to be able have power, the source of a number of other English words such as the auxiliary verb may, might both the verb and the noun, and machine, so basically words about ability or power. Now the shift in meaning of this word is the important thing here. The old Iranian word magush referred to a priest or perhaps originally a priestly caste. This was the original sense in Greek too, referring specifically to the Zoroastrian priests of the Persians, but it gradually came to have the connotation of magician rather than priest, and it's in that sense that we have the English word magic. Well, one religion's holy priest is another religion's dangerous magician. And this distinction was applied within religions too, with for instance early mainstream Christians denouncing the Gnostics as adherents of magic, and later the Protestants referring dismissively to Catholic magic. In fact, the definition of magic is pretty tricky even today, and so I've brought in someone much more knowledgeable about it to help me. Andrew Mark Henry of Religion for Breakfast has thought a lot about this. So Andrew, what's the difference between magic and religion, and where does science fit into it all? Thanks Mark, those are some really tough questions, because as you said, religion and magic are very subjective terms. One person's religion is another person's scary deviant magic. In fact, for the Romans, the Latin word magia had very pejorative connotations. It was used to describe any ritual that they didn't like, or that they thought was secretive, violent, or subversive. This long history of magic being considered a category of dark and scary rituals has influenced how modern scholars have tried to define magic in relation to religion today. So for example in the 1920s, the Archbishop Alexander Leroy describes magic as the perversion of science as well as of religion, and the archaeologist Alphonse Barb describes magic as a degenerate form of religion. Just like how food slowly rots away, magic is the rotten refuse of pure religion that's been corrupted by human human frailty and selfishness. The thing is, these are not academic ways to define magic. It's only been in recent decades that scholars have tried to craft objective definitions of magic with varying degrees of success. So for example, the archaeologist Andrew Wilburn has defined magic as mechanistic ritual that draws on religious practice, sometimes exoticized forms of religious practice, to try to serve personal ends, like healing a sickness, exercising a demon, or cursing a rival. As for science, magic is deeply intertwined with the history of science. In fact, I often joke that Isaac Newton is not the first great scientist, but the last great magician, because he wrote tons and tons of books on the occult, astrology, alchemy, stuff like that. And lots of the famous names from the scientific revolution and the enlightenment were also super into the occult. And on some level this makes sense, right? If you're making a magic potion that has a lot of elements of scientific experimentation, expert knowledge, trying to gather ingredients together to try to affect nature. So it's here in the 21st century that we have starkly differentiated between science, magic, religion, but for many people in the past these three categories of knowledge were very blurry and overlapped each other. Thanks Andrew, that's helpful. But as you say, I guess there's no definitive way to distinguish between magic and religion and other forms of knowledge, especially in the ancient world. And that brings us back to the Magi. The word magush, or its Greek form magos, referred to a priest of the Zoroastrian religion. To this day, a certain type of Zoroastrian priest is called a mobad, which is a contraction of magupati, meaning something like priestmaster. The details are a little unclear, since most of the evidence we have of them is from the foreign perspective of Greek writers, but it seems the Magush castes were priests in an older Iranian polytheistic tradition. But sometime around the 8th century BCE they adopted the monotheistic Zoroastrian religion. It seems that with the unification of the Persian Empire under Cyrus the Great, the specifically Median Magush caste spread more generally throughout Iran. 
the later 5th century Greek physician and historian Ctesias referred to Zarathustra, who was the founder of Zoroastrianism, and whose name became Zoroaster in Greek, as a Magos himself. Whatever the details might be, the Magoshes came to be associated with Zoroastrianism. It's important to keep in mind that Zoroastrianism wasn't a completely new religion, but a modification of older traditions. Scholars aren't certain when the prophet Zarathustra lived, but it's estimated to be in the 2nd millennium BCE, or perhaps a little later around the 7th or 6th century BCE, closer to the time of Cyrus the Great. He was a religious reformer who promoted the idea of one god, Ahura Mazda, and the importance of human free will and personal ethics over ritual and sacrifice. Ahura Mazda's name, by the way, which means literally wise spirit or lord, comes ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European roots Ansu, spirit, which produced the words Aesir and Asgard, the names of the Old Norse gods and their abode respectively, men to think, and day to set or put. Over time, the other old Iranian gods came to be demonized and were referred to as Daivas. Daiva is cognate with Sanskrit Deva, one of the terms for a deity in Hinduism, and goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root Dyeu, meaning to shine, but also used to refer to a skyfather god, Dyeu or Dyeu Pater, which spread with the Indo-European languages, becoming Jupiter in Latin, Zeus in Greek, and Tyr or Tu in the Germanic pantheon, now reflected in the word Tuesday. It's also the root behind such words as divine, deity, and Latin deus, god, as in deus ex machina, literally god from the machine, referring to an unlikely solution to an unsolvable problem to resolve a plot. And as we've seen already, machina and English machine come from the same root as magic. The other important concept of Zoroastrianism to keep in mind are the principles of Asha and Druj, meaning roughly truth and the lie, and the ongoing struggle between these forces, essentially a dualistic battle between good and evil. The word Asha or Arta comes ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root R to fit together, which also gives us such words as order, harmony, rhyme, and right, as in a religious rite. The word Druj or Drug comes ultimately from Proto-Indo-European Dreug, meaning to deceive, a concept we'll return to. Fittingly for this time of year, the root also leads to Old Norse Draugr, a kind of undead creature similar to a revenant or zombie, probably via the idea of a phantom. The word also gives us the English word dream, which makes sense if you think of dreams as deceptive. This brings us to the connection between dreams and magic, as one of the roles of the magush or magi seems to have been dream interpretation. Another word we have for dreams, at least bad dreams, is nightmare, which also has its origins in Old English. Actually, the compound word nightmare doesn't show up until the late 13th century, but is made up of the Old English words nicht and mara. But Old English Mara and the word nightmare itself didn't originally refer to a bad dream. The Old English Mara originally referred to a kind of female incubus who would sit upon people's chests while they slept, producing a feeling of suffocation. And that was the original meaning of the compound nightmare as well. By the 16th century the word nightmare could also refer to the feeling of suffocation, and it wasn't until as late as the 19th century that nightmare could refer to any bad dream. Now Old English Mara can be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European root mare, which meant to rub away harm, a sense we can still see in the derivative of mortar, as in a mortar and pestle. That root also led to a number of words having to do with death, such as mortal and murder. Interestingly, it's also the source of the first element of Morrigan, the Irish goddess associated with both war and fate, specifically with the foretelling of death or victory in battle, who may have been the source of the figure in Arthurian legend Morgan le Fay, a magical enchantress. Now when we think about dreams and nightmares and supernatural beings who attack you in your sleep, we might also think of the character Freddy Krueger in the 1984 film A Nightmare on Elm Street, who attacks his teenage victims in their dreams. This film, along with the 1978 film Halloween, with a newly released 2018 sequel, appropriate for this time of year, featuring Michael Myers, who also targets teenagers, are perhaps two of the best known examples of the genre of slasher films, a subgenre of horror films. Horror films, which drew their inspiration from gothic literature like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Bram Stoker's Dracula, were kicked off by the early film pioneer Georges Méliès, who used a variety of visual effects techniques such as substitution splices, multiple exposures, and time-lapse photography to achieve the supernatural events in his horror films, which he also used in his early science fiction films. Méliès, who had also been a stage magician, bringing us back to magic again, also developed the trick film genre, using those same film techniques, what we might call trick photography to allow a magician in a film to be able to do the seemingly impossible. And so magic tricks also brings us to the idea of deception that we saw with the roots of the words dream and druge. The word trick comes into English from Old French trick, 
deceit, treachery, cheating, and trichier, cheat, trick, deceive, and is thus related to the word treachery. But the origin of the Old French words is uncertain. They might come from Latin tricari, to trifle, dally, play tricks, from the plural noun trichai, perplexities, wiles, tricks, which also gives us the word extricate, literally to get out of perplexities. Alternatively, it might instead come into French from a Germanic source related to Dutch trick, drawing, pole, which also has the sense trick, cunning, and is traceable back to the Proto-Indo-European root drag, to draw, drag on the ground. There's a related rhyming variant of this root, trog, to draw, drag, move, which comes into Latin as trahera, to pull, draw, which comes into English in a number of different forms, such as traction, tractor, train, attract, contract, and treat. The sense development for treat goes like this. The Latin frequentative form of trahera is tractara, to manage, handle, deal with, discuss, which comes into Old French as traitier, to deal with, act towards, set forth in speech or writing. This comes into Middle English with the sense negotiate, bargain, deal with, and we can see this sense in the related word treaty, and from this develop the later senses of to heal, cure, and to entertain with food or drink, and anything that gives pleasure. So if this tricky etymology is correct, Halloween trick-or-treating doesn't really offer a choice as it's etymologically redundant. Now getting back to magic tricks, which deceive the audience for the purposes of entertainment, the stage magician often achieves this through misdirection and sleight of hand, often using a magic wand to draw the gaze of the viewer. Now of course beyond the worlds of stage magic and fiction, with Harry Potter's wand or Gandalf's staff, there are ancient traditions of wands used for magical purposes, probably based on the scepters that were widespread symbols of rulership. For instance, in Homer's Odyssey, the witch Circe uses a magic rod, called a rabdos in Greek, to transform Odysseus's men into swine, and in the biblical book of Exodus, when Moses and Aaron try to coerce Pharaoh into freeing the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt, the first wonder is Aaron throwing down his rod, which is translated into Greek as rabdos in the Septuagint, and transforming it into a serpent. Another bit of stage magic that also has a real historical foundation is the crystal ball, now the cliché of the amusement park fortune teller. In the 16th century, John Dee, mathematician, astronomer, and occult philosopher, who was an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I, gazed into crystals in an attempt to see visions of angels. This is part of a larger category called scrying, in which the practitioner stares into a reflective, refractive, or luminescent surface or object, such as water, a mirror, or fire, in order to gain some sort of prophecy or revelation. And in a sense, this is kind of similar and sometimes overlaps with dream interpretation, otherwise known as oniromancy. One famous example of this comes from the biblical book of Genesis, the famous Joseph who had the coat of many colours. Joseph was given that coat because he was the favourite son of his father Jacob, who was also by the way prone to receiving dream visions, having earlier received the vision of a stairway to heaven. No, not that stairway to heaven, Jacob's ladder. Well, in addition to receiving that technicolour sign of his father's favouritism, Joseph also had two dreams which symbolically showed his brothers bowing down to him. So his brothers were naturally jealous of him and sold him into slavery, and convinced their father that he was killed by wild beasts. Through a series of adventures in Egypt, in which Joseph accurately interpreted the prophetic dreams of fellow prisoners, and later interpreting the dream of the pharaoh predicting seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine, thus advising him to store up surplus grain, Joseph was made vizier of Egypt. Now during that famine many people came to Egypt to purchase grain, including Joseph's brothers. So Joseph devised a trick for them, planting a silver cup in the sack of one of his brothers and then pretending it was stolen. When Joseph's steward found the cup in the possession of the brothers, he said it belonged to his master and was the cup Joseph used for divination, in other words, scrying. Well, in the end, Joseph was reunited with his brothers and father, but his prophetic dream had come true, his brothers did bow down to him as vizier. And this isn't the only ancient story of a cup being used for scrying. In Persian mythology is the cup of Jamshid, a magical cup that contained the elixir of immortality and was also used for scrying. Many Persian literary texts describe this cup being used by Jamshid and other mythological kings, including in the Shahnameh, the great national epic of Greater Iran, which tells the mythological and historical past of the Persian Empire, including the life of the prophet Zarathustra, which brings us back once again to Zoroastrianism and prophecy. The word prophecy comes from Greek pro, before, and phanai, to speak, and a particularly deceptive form that essentially tricks its recipient is the self-fulfilling prophecy. One of the most famous literary examples of this is in Shakespeare's Macbeth, in which Macbeth gets the prophecy from the witches that he will become king, and then goes on to make it happen by killing the king and usurping the throne. 
in Oedipus the King by the Greek playwright Sophocles, in order to avoid the prophecy that the baby Oedipus will grow up to kill his father, his parents leave the baby to die on a mountain top. But he is rescued and given to surrogate parents, with the result that when Oedipus grows up and gets the prophecy that he'll kill his father and marry his mother, he leaves his supposed parents to avoid it, and ends up fulfilling both prophecies. Or, if you want a more recent example, to return to Harry Potter again, in reaction to the prophecy that a child born on a certain day will kill him, Voldemort tries to murder the infant Harry, thus making Harry the one who is eventually able to defeat Voldemort. Now one of the reasons that self-fulfilling prophecies work is that they give the receiver the confidence to make those events happen, as in the case of Macbeth. The word confidence, by the way, comes from the Latin intensive prefix com plus the word fidera, to trust, and lies behind the term confidence trip sometimes shortened simply to con, thus bringing us back to the theme of deception, which is well known in the gambling con in which the victim is allowed to win several times to build up his confidence before taking him for all he's worth. A famous historical example of a self-fulfilling prophecy involves Cyrus the Great, founder of the Achaemenid Empire who I mentioned earlier. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, Cyrus's grandfather Astyages had prophetic dreams which were interpreted by the Magi as meaning his grandson would usurp his throne. Fearing this, he ordered his general Harpagus to kill the baby, but he couldn't bring himself to do it, and passed the job on to a cowherd, who also couldn't go through with it, and brought the baby up as his own. Years later, when Cyrus had grown up and all of this was revealed, Astyages punished Harpagus by killing his son, but after the Magi backpedaled and said that they had misinterpreted the dream, Cyrus was spared. In revenge, Harpagus encouraged Cyrus to revolt against Astyages and take over, and he did just that. So I guess the moral of the story is, watch out for those magi dream interpretations. And returning to the magi and the word magush, its first attestation is in the Behistun inscription by Darius the Great, the fourth king of the Achaemenid Empire, which is a bit of propaganda that tells of how he came to the throne. Basically, when Cyrus died, he was succeeded by his son Cambyses II. According to Herodotus, Cambyses had a dream in which he saw his younger brother Bardia sitting on the royal throne, and had him secretly killed. Then, according to Darius, a magush named Gaumata impersonated the dead Bardia and eventually came to the throne. Darius soon after usurped the throne from the impostor Gaumata. Of course, it's entirely possible that Darius made this up to legitimize his claim to the throne with Gaumata being an impostor, and he further legitimizes his claim by stating in the Behistun inscription that he became king by grace of Ahura Mazda. Whatever the truth may be, we certainly see several more examples here of our recurring theme of deception, not to mention prophetic dreams. With these sorts of stories circulated by Greek authors, it's not too surprising that the Magi gain the reputation for not only being magicians, but also for being devious and deceptive. Furthermore, unlike Greek priests, the Magi would whisper their prayers and ritual texts in a low voice, and in the unfamiliar Avestan language of the Zoroastrian religious texts, which may have sounded to the Greeks like incantations. Interestingly, the native Greek word for magic, goetea, with goes meaning sorcerer, or literally one who howls out enchantments, comes from the Greek verb goon, to wail, groan, weep, from a Proto-Indo-European root that meant to call or cry. The Greeks had other words for particular types of magic, such as necromantea, necromancy or the communication with the dead for prophetic purposes, from necros, dead body, and mantea, divination oracle, derived from mynesthai, to be inspired, from men, to think, one of the Proto-Indo-European roots that lies behind the name Ahura Mazda. And the word pharmakeia, from which we get the word pharmacy, referred to the practice of using drugs, poisons and medicines. But the word magia soon became a more general term for magic in Greek. Nevertheless, the Greeks were often also quite sceptical about magic. Herodotus recounts the story of Darius's successor Xerxes, who when sailing his fleet to attack Greece was hindered by a storm, but the Magi were able to quell the storm with their sacrifices and incantations allowing them to proceed. Or, as Herodotus dryly wrote, perhaps it abated of its own accord. And in that self-fulfilling prophecy play Oedipus the King, Sophocles has Oedipus use the word magos as a term of abuse directed at the soothsayer Tiresias when he gave him a prediction he didn't like. So the word also came to have the sense of a charlatan in Greek. The magi in the biblical nativity narrative probably originally implied the use of magic and astrology since they predicted and located the Christ child from the stars. But in later Christian traditions, the Magi are often rendered as the Three Kings or the Three Wise Men, reflecting later Christianity's discomfort with magic, which they held to be the work of the devil. In any case, the Greek words magos and magia were subsequently borrowed into Latin as magus and magia, initially with the specific reference of Persian practices, as for instance by the Roman orator Cicero, but soon in the more general sense as for instance by the poet Virgil. 
Interestingly, Virgil came to have a rather magical reputation himself. A practice arose of using Virgil's writings for a form of bibliomancy, that is, divination using books, called specifically Sortes Virgilianae or Virgilian Lots. Basically the way it works is, you take a text and randomly pick a passage from it, by for instance balancing a book on its spine and letting it fall open to a random page, and that passage would give you your prediction or answer to your question. Virgil wasn't the first author to be used this way. The Greek poet Homer is the source for the Sortes Homericae, with the philosopher Plato reporting a similar form of this being used by his former teacher Socrates to predict his day of execution, but the practice continued into the Roman era. Later on Christians would use the Bible for the Sortes Sanctorum, but the Sortes Virgilianae was the most popular technique, with one early example being Hadrian's use of it to judge the Emperor Trajan's attitude toward him when it correctly predicted that he would be adopted by the Emperor as his heir. The practice continued through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, and correctly predicted the death of King Charles I when the Viscount Falkland suggested the King try this as a light-hearted pastime when they came across a finely printed and bound edition of Virgil. To mitigate the damage, the Viscount tried it himself, hoping to hit upon some irrelevant passage and discredit the King's prediction, only to correctly predict his own death. I guess with divination you should be careful what you ask. The really surprising thing here though is that in the Middle Ages Virgil came to be thought of as a magician himself, and numerous stories and legends that had nothing to do with the poet's own biography sprang up about Virgil being an astrologer able to predict the future and a wizard able to perform great feats of magic. Some of the things that sparked this belief were the mystic element in Book 6 of the Aeneid and the prophetic nature of his fourth eclogue which Christians took as prophesying the coming of Christ. Even his name was seen as being a clue, since the name Virgil is similar to the Latin word virga, wand, and he was said to have a maternal grandfather named Magus. Well, his mother did indeed come from a Roman family with the name Magia, though it's not related to the word Magus. In medieval Wales this reputation was so strong that the Welshified version of his name became a generic term for a magician, which today is the modern Welsh word for a pharmacist. Now that Latin word sortes, or sores in the singular form, comes from the Proto-Indo-European root ser, to line up. In Latin the word was originally used to refer to little pieces of wood used to draw lots, but later came to refer to what is allotted by fate, and thus fortune, and then to any kind of fortune telling. From that it later developed the sense rank, class, or order, and it's that sense that we see in the English word sort. The word sortition refers to the drawing of lots, like a lottery, and the word lottery is related to the word lot, coming from a Germanic root, and thus bringing us back to the theme of gambling which we last saw in the gambling con. The other way this root makes it into English are the words sorcery and sorcerer, from Old French sorcerie and sorcière, originally one who predicts or influences fate or fortune, but broadening to mean one who uses magic. The more precise word now for fortune telling by drawing lots is claromancy, another of those mancy terms like necromancy, bibliomancy, and oniromancy. The first element of claromancy is the Greek kleros, lot allotment, from the Proto-Indo-European root kel, to strike or cut, from the idea of that which is cut off. Also from Greek kleros is Greek klerikos, Latin clericus, and English cleric, clerk, and clergy. So how do we get to here from there? Well, from the sense allotment, kleros also came to mean inheritance, which is how it's used in the Greek translation of the biblical book Leviticus in reference to assistance to the temple priests. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren, the Lord is their inheritance. So the word came to refer to matters having to do with priests, and eventually priest and the priesthood itself. In the Middle Ages, clerks, sometimes now pronounced clerks, were the only well-educated people available, and so in addition to their religious duties also used their skills as accountants, and from that we get the modern sense of clerk, which is broadened further to include clerical bureaucratic duties and even store clerks. The word cleric was re-borrowed into English to replace clerk, which had thus become ambiguous. But clergy brings us back to the theme of priests, like the original role of those magi, though the clergy probably don't engage in claromancy in spite of the etymology. Probably. So far we've talked about priests and other male magicians, but what about witches? The word witch obviously carries a lot of baggage with it. For one thing it's a gendered word referring specifically to women, and beyond its main magical sense, witch or old witch can be used as a contemptuous term for a disliked woman, though it should be noted that in more recent times there has been an attempt to reclaim the word witch in a more positive context, as for instance is sometimes done by the neo-pagan world of Wicca and in the Harry Potter world. Hermione is indeed the most gifted witch of her generation. Witches in the Middle Ages and early modern periods were suspected of many things, including preventing conception in women and attacking male fertility, sometimes actually stealing men's penises, storing them in large chests, or in birds' nests in trees. 
Historically, many women have been persecuted for the supposed crime of witchcraft, justified in part by the 15th century Christian treatise Malleus Maleficarum, the witch's hammer, and you can tell it's specifically women targeted here because of the feminine Latin ending arum. It's hard to know how many women were persecuted, tortured, and burned during the witch hunts of the 15th to 18th centuries, but some estimates place it at 60,000 to 200,000 to even as high as several million, and it's perhaps little surprise that the word wicked is derived from the same Old English root that produced the word witch. I guess you could say that wicked witch is etymologically redundant. Witch comes from the Old English word witcha, meaning witch, which has the masculine form wicca, meaning male witch or wizard, from which we get the modern word wicca in reference to neo-paganism. It should be pointed out that there is no historical line of connection for this word from Old English to the present, with the word having been reintroduced into modern English in the early 20th century. The further etymology of the word witch is very disputed, with many suggestions being made. The brothers Grimm, who I suppose would know a thing or two about witch stories, propose that Old English witcha and wicca come from the Proto-Indo-European root wake, to separate or divide, reflecting the practice of claromancy, which according to the Roman ethnographer Tacitus was part of early Germanic religious practice. But Indo-Europeanist Calvert Watkins proposed that it comes from the root weg, meaning to be strong or lively, in the sense of to wake or rouse, reflecting the practice of necromancy, in other words one who wakes the dead. If true, which would be cognate with wake, watch, and wait, as well as vegetable, which is probably not the sort of thing you give out to trick-or-treaters dressed up as witches. And though there are numerous other suggested etymologies, I'll give you just one more, that it might be traced back to a homophonous root wake, which in this case means consecrated or holy, and has a number of other derivatives connected to religion and magic. For instance German Weihnachten, literally holy night, used specifically in reference to Christmas. But we better leave Christmas aside because this is Halloween and Latin victima, an English victim, in reference to animals used in religious sacrifices. But most interestingly for our purposes, the words guile and wile, both referring to deceit or trickery, which would then be akin to Old English wigla, divination, sorcery, but which also bring us back to our ongoing theme of deception. But there are a lot more terms for male magic practitioners. In the Harry Potter world that would be wizard, but wizard has more of a positive connotation, so for a better parallel to witch, let's turn to the word warlock. Interestingly, the word didn't originally have any connection to magic. In Old English the word warloga meant traitor, liar, oathbreaker, reminding us again of the theme of deception, and by extension it was sometimes used to refer to the devil. It's only later in the 16th century in Scots that the word came to be used as the male equivalent of a witch. Etymologically it breaks down into two elements, the second of which is leogan, to lie, which also gives us the word lie. The first element is war, faith, fidelity, agreement, from the Proto-Indo-European root wero, true, trustworthy, which also leads to the Latin word veritas, sometimes thought of by the Romans as the personification of truth, and related to such English words as verify and veracity. So literally a warlock is a truth liar. Now this brings us back to the concept of truth, the opposite of lies and deceptions, opposing ideas which you'll remember as the opposing forces in Zoroastrian, Asha, and Druge. There are a number of words in English that mean truth, including the now somewhat archaic word sooth. The Old English form soth was actually quite common and comes from the Proto-Indo-European root s that supplies several of the forms of the irregular verb to be, such as is and am, as well as words such as yes, essence, and sin. Though the word sooth today is somewhat obscure, the compound soothsayer, meaning a fortune teller or prophet, is rather more well known, being used for instance to describe Tiresias in the Oedipus story, along with seer, literally one who sees. The word truth itself has a fascinating etymology. It goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root dero to be firm, solid, steadfast, which also has the specialized senses of tree and wood, especially oak, including the word tree itself. It's also the second element in the word ausatru, a term used to refer to a neo-pagan group focused on the Old Norse mythological tradition, which means literally faith or allegiance to the Aesir, the pantheon of Norse gods, and we've already seen that first element as the root lying behind the name of the Zoroastrian god Hura Mazda. The Norse, by the way, also had their own tradition of magic, called Sather, associated with the gods Odin and Freya. The word Sather comes from the Proto-Indo-European root Sai, meaning to bind or tie, which also has the derivatives sinew and secular, which originally as Latin saeculum meant age, span of time, and came to mean worldly, not religious. Other derivatives of Deru, solid tree, are Dryad, a tree nymph in Greek mythology, and Druid, the high-ranking priestly class who also wielded considerable secular power among the Celtic peoples. So the Druids are another example of a priestly class, like the Magi and the clergy, who were also mistrusted by external cultures, in this case the Romans during the Roman Britain period. 
The second element of the word druid comes from the Proto-Indo-European wade, to see, which has such other derivatives as vision, view, and evident, as well as wise, wisdom, and wit. So a druid is someone who is wise about trees. And from the word wise we also get in the Middle English period the word wizard, literally a wise man, but it soon gained the more specific sense of a magician. Also from this root we get the Old English term Wittenyamont, referring to the council of advisers to the king in Anglo-Saxon England, who technically were in charge of electing the kings. Though this political body didn't survive past the Norman conquest of England, it seems to have been the inspiration behind J.K. Rowling's Wizengamot, the wizard court of law in the Harry Potter world, obviously also playing off the word wizard. But as we've seen the word wizard comes from the same root anyway, and in any case the wizards we know today such as Albus Dumbledore and Gandalf are also quite wise and indeed witty. And all this talk about wizards and magic brings us to our conclusion, tying many of these elements together, specifically to the deck building game Magic the Gathering, published by the games company Wizards of the Coast, who by the way are also the current publishers of Dungeons and Dragons, after they bought out its original company TSR. In various versions of D&D different levels of magicians or magic users as they were called in the game were known by specific words, many of which we've covered in this video, such as seer, magician, enchanter, warlock or witch, sorcerer, necromancer, and wizard. The game Magic the Gathering, which also has magic users known as mages by the way, was developed by Richard Garfield who had been a combinatorial mathematics doctoral student at the University of Pennsylvania, and apparently he created it so that he and his friends would have something to do while they waited for everyone to turn up for their D&D games. Garfield has two other claims to fame. His great great grandfather was James A. Garfield, a rather minor US president having been assassinated within his first year in office and his granduncle Samuel B. Fay invented the paperclip. Unless you ask the Norwegians who have their own candidate for this honour, Johan Waller, whose version of the paperclip was adopted as a symbol of resistance against the Nazis, after pins or badges bearing national symbols were banned. As for Magic the Gathering itself, it originally had an aspect of gambling since according to the original rules one was supposed to ante up a card in order to play which the winner would then be able to claim at the end of the game, and even now the packs come with random assortments of rare cards which can be quite valuable. So whether it's card tricks or tarot cards, or the three card Monticon, or Magic the Gathering, or all the way back to exotic Zoroastrian priests and self-fulfilling prophecies, falsely accused witches and crystal ball gazing wizards, it seems perhaps that for magic luck, deception, and shifting perceptions have always been on the cards. So we wanted to pick up on just a few elements that we you know, talked about only briefly. But before we do that we should also uh, say again to thank you to um, Andrew Mark Henry. Yes indeed. Uh, for being part of that um, and to remind you that if you're interested in more about religion, not only religion in the ancient world but quite a lot of religion in the ancient world, uh, his channel Religion for Breakfast is really good and you should head over and check that out. Yes indeed. So why don't we start off with spells? Okay. Because practitioners of magic are often depicted as casting spells or charms. Mm -hmm. So the words incantation and charm both come from the Proto-Indo-European root can to sing mm -hmm. via Latin cantare in the instance of incantation, incantation. Mm -hmm. and carmen, which becomes charm. Mm -hmm. Now carmen meant song, but it could also mean incantation or prophecy. Mm -hmm. So it was already kind of gaining that, that magical sense. Or poem. Sense. Yeah. Or poem. Yeah. yeah. Another word that comes from this same root is enchantment or enchant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As for spell, well that comes to the Germanic branch of languages from the Proto-Indo-European root spell, which meant to say aloud or recite, mm -hmm. from which it gets both its magical sense, a spell that you would yeah. you would have yeah. to say the words, and it also got its uh, sense of uh, reading out some reading a word out letter by letter. So you mm. spell the word. Right. Now a book of spells is called a grimoire. Mm -hmm. Not a, a word that is perhaps all that well known now, but... If you read enough fantasy novels you've <laughs> come across it in your time. Well this word, believe it or not, is related to the word grammar. Right, right. Because uh, the arcane work of grammarians suggested arcane knowledge, perhaps of magic. You, know, mm, you can't mm -hmm. trust those grammarians. No, 
<laughs> well, I mean, obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> and the the Scottish English form of the word uh, grammar is uh, glamour. Mm, right. So that has a magical sense originally, but it gains its sort of modern sense from the idea that a glamorous person kind of casts a spell on you. So I guess sort of like a love spell or something. Yeah, or just, uh, yeah, attracts your attention or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. But personally, I find uh, books about grammar quite glamorous and quite magical. So <sighs> <laughs> I can't decide what's worst that you really do or that you true, just made that so joke true. up. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, there are also specific words for bad or evil spells, <sighs> several of them, in fact. Mm hmm. So, for instance, curse. The origin of the word curse is uncertain, uh, but it might be related to the word course mm -hmm. um, from Latin cursus in the sort of Christian sense of a set of liturgical prayers. So you'd go through the course of spells. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, the course of prayers. Uh, <laughs> as, as, as you said, <laughs> it's a fine line. line. Yeah. Or alternatively, it might come from the old French word curus, which meant anger, uh, coming ultimately from the Latin uh, verb corrumpera, to destroy, hmm. which also gives us the English word corrupt. Right. Right. Now, jinx is another bad magic spell that uh, indeed comes up in the Harry Potter world, mm -hmm. among other places. Mm -hmm. But it's actually quite a modern word. Uh, it, it, uh, in its modern sense, it's actually a, a baseball term from the early 20th century. Hmm. meaning a person or thing that brings bad luck, or as a verb, uh, you know, to jinx, to bring bad luck upon. And this sort of modern word jinx comes from an earlier word jinx spelled with a Y, J-Y-N-X, mm -hmm. uh, which referred to a type of bird, the Rhineck. <laughs> ah, yes, that Rhineck. <laughs> You said this. I I know I looked up pictures of it for, but I have still I have no idea what that bird is. <laughs> well, the the connection is that supposedly the uh, the Rhineck could be used. The, well, the word jinx could be used to refer to a charm or spell, since uh, there was a tradition of using the bird for magical purposes, and this goes back to the ancient world. In fact, right. So that word goes back to Latin jinx and Greek jinx. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately from the Greek verb yutzain, mm -hmm. to shout or yell, mm, Okay, uh, in reference to the bird's call. So right. it must have had a very strident call, I'm guessing. I'm sure this will, the memes will have moved on from this point, but that reminds me of the one that's going around right now about the, this male bird has the loudest call oh, and oh, shouts right, in yeah. females. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if he's a jinx. <laughs> Maybe. In one sense or another. <laughs> well, yes. And so in, in both Greek and Roman magical practices, uh, this particular uh, species of bird was used in magical spells, specifically to regain the affections of an unfaithful lover. Okay. But I will leave it to you to decide whether or not such a spell uh, would be considered a type of curse. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> male entitlement. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> but... Clearly, J.K. Rowling was drawing on, more on the sort of modern sense of the word jinx, um, especially mm -hmm. when... Something that causes bad something luck. Something that causes bad yeah. luck, especially when she has Hermione uh, mistakenly identifying Snape as the uh, as using a jinx on Harry's broom in the first Quidditch match, mm -hmm. which is actually quite appropriate, given that this has the baseball yeah. connection. Yeah, and the sports. So this is another sports thing. Mm -hmm. So good word for her to use. Another type of curse spell which uh, makes an appearance in the Harry Potter world is the word hex. Mm -hmm. So the word hex is also a relative latecomer, first showing up in American English um, as both the noun and the verb uh, in the 19th century. Hmm. So not that far back. No. It comes from Pennsylvania German, often misleadingly referred Oof, to as Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch. Dutch right? It's actually just a form of German. And it can be traced back through the Germanic branch to the Proto-Indo-European root kag, which meant uh, to seize or catch, but could also mean uh, a wickerwork or fence. 
So what's the connection here with evil magic? Mm. Well, essentially, the idea of the root is an enclosure. That's why it has that catching mm-hmm. idea okay. and therefore a fence. So you put yeah. you might put animals in some Inside kind of an fence, enclosure yeah. or something. And so this root, therefore, also gives us the word hedge, which you would use to enclose a property. Yeah, right. right. And the word also seems to have gained, therefore, magical implications, possibly from the sort of liminal nature of a hedge or fence, right? It's a boundary. Yeah. And magic is always or often associated with boundaries. Yeah. Crossing boundaries or especially ones that are not meant to be crossed. Yeah. And in Mm -hmm. fact, supernatural in general, not just Mm -hmm. magic, but any, you know, kind of supernatural thing is seen as, you know, like the boundary between life and death or human and natural, unnatural or all those things. Yeah. And so in an enclosure, therefore, you know, it would be safe and civilized on the inside, but dangerous and magical outside. Right. And so that root also led to the word ha, as in hawthorn, mm-hmm. which is an important tree in Northern European uh, pagan religions, and also to the Old English word uh, hagtessa, hmm. which means witch. Okay. As well as the old High German word, hag, now, let me see if I can pronounce <laughs> the old High German correctly. I guess it's hag, hagzisa. Fortunately, I am in no or position hag-zisa. to tell you whether it was right or not. <laughs> in any case, that word uh, was shortened to, uh, becoming in modern German, simply hex and the verb hexen. Right. Okay. And so the second element of those two words words, the old high German and the and the old English word, the, the Tessa part in uh, Hag Tessa, mm-hmm. English Hag Tessa, uh, that is likely from uh, the root uh, Tusio, which meant something along the lines of ghost or specter. Okay. So a Hag Tessa uh, was originally something that haunted the outskirts of a settlement. Hmm. Right along that. Yeah. That, right on that boundary. That boundary. Yeah. And so the Old English word uh, was shortened to, um, eventually giving us the word hag. Right. Which, which, which can origi- mean. Yeah. Yeah. Which. Which, yeah. It, it, I mean, now can just be used to to refer to just an old woman mm-hmm. in a derogatory, in a derogatory yeah. way. Uh, but originally, it specifically meant a witch. How now, though? Dark and midnight hags? Right. In Macbeth, right? Right. It's, yeah. Yeah. So. Spells. Spells. So you mentioned... You know, love, trying to get people's love back and mm-hmm. all that. I thought I'd talk a little bit briefly about some ancient spells because, weirdly, I was looking at one of the books. We actually know more about spells than we know about prayers hmm. in some ways about the ancient world. Which you would might, not expect, it, yeah, right? That because it's surprising. And, and I mean, we know some pr- prayers, but prayers didn't get written down very often. Hmm. Uh, or not in sort of, you know, so we have some formal ones in some epics and things like that, that. But in terms of what actually happened, the rituals that went on at temples, they weren't written down in a form that we would have now, right? If they were written down at all, they were just texts that were used by priests to memorize and then do. It's not really a scripture based religion. No, no, exactly. There's no like book of common prayer, right? right? Like if you think about it, it's the Bible isn't even prayers. I mean, there are prayers in the mm-hmm. Bible, but not many. Um, if you went to a Christian service now, most of the prayers you hear are in the Book of Common Prayer or right. some other liturgical book. It's a separate mm-hmm. book from even the Bible. And the ancient world didn't even have a Bible. So, But spells, on the other hand, we have a number of sources that have survived, even though spells by their nature were usually not done in public. So one of the divisions between religion and magic in the ancient world is that magic is practiced in secret, while religion is almost, I mean, you can pray privately, but basically in in ancient Greece and Rome in general, it's a public performance. It's a a public process, right? You, and it served a social function. It served a social function, but even if it was for a private purpose, you'd mm-hmm. go to a temple and you'd say the prayers out loud or... You know, you talked about that in the in the video about um, the difference between the Magi um, whispering their prayers, right. right? And the Greeks and Romans didn't whisper prayers. I mean, you were trying to catch the attention of the gods, among other things, so you said them out loud. 
Magic, on the other hand, was usually practiced secretly. And not all magic is for this purpose, but one of the reads th- another distinction between magic and and religion is that magic was often employed when the thing you wanted was not socially acceptable. Hmm. So how do you go to the temple and pray <laughs> out loud that you want to sleep with your neighbor's daughter or that you want to curse your rival? Right. Those are not acceptable. Those are not acceptable things. So magic then becomes a way of trying to produce effects that you can't admit to in public, uh, especially violent ones or illicit ones. Now, that's not the only thing. People also use magic to try to get heal people and things. Mm. But but there is this element of, of secretive and illicitness to magic. So you would think we wouldn't know spells. Mm. However, there's two main ways we do. One is curse tablets. So curse tablets we talked about already. When we talked to Car- Carly Silver, we talked about curse tablets yeah. in some detail. But if you didn't hear that one, they're basically a type of magic where you write down the spell you want enacted on a piece of metal or some uh, maybe other things as well. But the important point is sometimes it was on lead, which of course survives as opposed to say wood or something else like that. And then you would roll it up and throw it in. You would bury it in a grave or throw it in a well or various other places, somewhere where it could kind of reach the spirits of the underworld, basically. Mm. You're trying to get it to the spirits of the underworld. Because these are on metal, they survive. So we have found a whole bunch of these. So while they were secret, they were never meant to be read by anyone except the powers that they were invoking. Paradoxically, we have yeah. those, right. whereas the s- prayers that were aloud. said aloud yeah. in public, mm-hmm. we don't have. Mm-hmm. Overlapping with this, there was a whole tradition, because they were illicit, you didn't learn them properly in the temple and things. So to, in order to know the spells, you could go and get spell books. And there were papyri, mm. which listed spells off that you could use. And they were aimed sort of at practitioners of magic rather than individuals um, so that they could, you know, what, what's the right spell for using in any, when somebody comes to you and wants you to help you with something. And so these existed and were passed around as well. So while we don't have a religious Bible or book of common prayer, we actually have the equivalent for magic. So how does this what does this tell us in terms of literacy? Like, were people doing doing these spell tablets themselves, or uh, were they hiring a professional? Both, basically. They could do them themselves, and that's one of the reasons there are these books, because you can mm-hmm. kind of go and just copy them out. And so if you have you know basic literacy, but not um, the capacity to make stuff up, all you have to do is copy it out, and there's blanks for where you put the names in. Right. Right? So you just copy the thing out, put in the names. But also, uh, a lot of the times you went to somebody for them, and they were formulaic. And, and it's Kyrie, and we have the curse tablets, and we're able to see curse tablets that follow the formulae that are in the papyri, papyri, even though the papyri that we have come to us mainly from the 3rd and 4th century AD. Mm-hmm. So, like, the physical mm-hmm. texts that we have are quite late, uh, while the curse tablets come from as early as 3rd and, f- um, I think, the 5th century BC onward in the Greek and then the Roman mm-hmm. world. And the text but, is still basically the same? I mean, I'm. this is not my specialty. I don't want to make an argument that I don't want to claim more than I... But I know that there are lots of overlaps. Okay. So there's enough formulae that stay fairly similar that they seem to be like, mm. you know, an ongoing tradition. Let's put it that way. That must be also useful for linguistic purposes to be able to yeah. compare. Yeah. I mean, a lot of subliterary texts are very useful hmm. for that kind of thing. And I don't know how much work is being done on that not being my uh, area. So so we have these surviving texts, even though they're low and subliter- subliterary and meant to be secretive. Right. We actually have some. So that, that actually, by the way, reminds me of in, in Norse practices. Mm-hmm. So for some of the, the rune stones, uh, you, you could carve runes like on the top of a really tall stone right which is not meant to be read by any person because it's kind of hard to get up there mm-hmm. it was meant to be read by the gods or whatever yeah. yeah yeah exactly and so this is these things that were not meant for people can nonetheless be useful right for our our later purposes so i thought i'd read a few of these curse tablets and um papyri just because they're interesting mm-hmm. and as i said a lot of them are for these illicit purposes so Talking, speaking of hexes, mm. what is something 
not socially acceptable that a lot of Romans, in particular, might have wanted to do. Oh, sorry, jinxes. Jinxes. Connected to jinxes. Sorry, I said hexes. You're trying to make someone else have a poor, have bad bad Mm -hmm. fortune. Mm -hmm. Could be in like elections or something like that. There were some of that, but more specifically to do with jinxes, sports. Sports. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Because of course, there's lots of sports, and specifically, (laughs) well. Chariot racing is ah. where in particular it comes up because there was lots of betting on chariot racing and also right. people were avid, avid fans of their particular teams, sure. right? So we don't know sometimes whether these are from other charioteers, you know, mm. but I think a lot of the time they're fans, right. as it were, or, you know, supporters and people are betting. Now, so here's one, and that actually comes from Phoenicia, but in the Greek world. Now, one of the things that a lot of these cursed habits have is they have magical words. Mm. And these are nonsense words that are sort of, sometimes they're corruptions of God's names from other, like foreign gods. Sometimes right. they seem to be just, it's the tradition that gives us abracadabra. Yeah, right. right? The actual, so well, I won't. That, that occurs in, in Norse stuff, well, mm-hmm. Germanic stuff mm-hmm. too, like the word alu, which literally means ale, but it's used in magical contexts that have nothing to do with So it ale. must have some, some other s- meaning sound or symbolism or something. Or yeah. something. Yeah. Well, so I'll read a bit of this. I won't read all of the um, nonsense words because they're long and hard to read, being nonsense words. But here's one. Orior barzagra akramakari fnu kenta baoth obarabao, you holy angels, ambush and restrain lulutau audanista them. The spell oitit. Okay, it goes on and on and on. Now, attack, bind, overturn, cut up, chop into pieces the horses and the charioteers of the blue team. Wow, that's pretty uh, <laughs> harsh. I will read from the book that I'm just quoting from. Although this seems a particularly vicious and bloodthirsty wish, we must remember that the person responsible may not have intended it any more literally than a sports fan of today who wants his or her team to crush or slaughter its opponents. Uh, Right. Right. Mm, True. And then there's another one that's a a business competition. So this is a cursed tablet from Carthage. Arthula lam semelisailam mayayu bachuk bakach six church. Anyway. Um, these sound more <laughs> outlandish than they would if you remember this. The rest of it's also Greek. These yeah, are not right. that far off right, right, right. Greek sounds, but they aren't Greek words. Lord gods, restrain and hinder the Falernian baths, lest anyone should be able to approach that place. Bind and bind up the Falernian baths from this day, lest any person should approach that place. The person responsible was possibly the owner of another bathhouse, seeking to undermine a rival establishment. Huh. So there you go. So those Some are some underhanded uh, business practices. I'm taking these, by the way, from Religion in the Roman Empire by James B. Reeves. I'll put mm-hmm. a comment in the in the show notes for the bibliography. Uh, another is a lead tablet from a grave in North Africa. And this is the prayer of a woman trying to win back a man who broke up with her. Ah. And you mention male entitlement. And yeah, you're not wrong. There's more men. We have a higher number of male speakers in these cursed tablets than women in the loved ones but there's a bunch of women too and i think it's people entitlement like you know the the curses are going to come from people who want something that they know is wrong right but they're going to want it anyway that's that's what the category of cursed tablets is going to be mm-hmm. and in a sense the male entitlement actually comes from thinking it's allowed right right like the cursed tablets you're gonna it's it's you're more often going to get the powerless people Doing, doing a curse, curse tablet right. than somebody who actually has the power to just take what they want. Mm-hmm. I invoke you, Daimonion spirit who lies here by the holy name Aoth, Abaoth, the god of Abraham, and Iao, the god of Jacob, Iao, Aoth, Abaoth, god of Israma. Hear the honored, dreadful, and great name. Go away to Urbanus, to whom Urbana gave birth, and bring him to Domitiana, to whom Gendida gave birth, so that loving, frantic, and sleepless with love and desire for her, he may beg her to return to his house and become his wife. And then a very similar one in an Egyptian papyrus. I adjure you, Euangolos, by Anubis and Hermes and all the rest down below, attract and bind Serapius, whom Helen bore, to this Herais, whom Thermutharin bore. Now, now, quickly, quickly. So you can see the sort of formulaic mm-hmm. nature, right? Mm-hmm. The repeat repetitions. Right. And notice those references to the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, 
that does not mean that this person is Jewish. Right. It almost certainly means they're not, in fact. What you get is invocation of a lot of foreign gods and gods that you look around and you're like, those people seem to think that's pretty powerful. Well, All right, magical. put that one in. Yeah. So Jesus, for instance, turns up in a lot of um, mm. the papyri, the Greek magical papyri, but you know, in long lists along with a whole bunch of other gods, not yeah. a special figure. Jesus and Moses and Solomon and people like that just are clearly powerful. Someone else's religion is magic. Yeah, you, exactly. So. so they get into these names. Mm -hmm. So those are a few. Um, uh, one point that was pointed out by one of the authors I was reading that I think is really interesting is in most or a lot of these cursed tablets, when people are identified, they're identified by being by who their mother is. You've noticed that? Someone who so-and-so bore. Right. That is not the normal classical mode for identifying somebody, right? right? When you speak, when you, you it's so patrilineal. Father, yeah. Right. yeah, so and so, son of so and so. I mean, that's their official legal name. I wonder to what degree that's some. A I mean, thing. a magical thing that has something to do with. I mean, one argument would be it has to do with magic being originally feminine or from a you know the female mother goddess religion that's been supplanted by male religions. If you uh, believe that. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> problems with that theory. But I do wonder, I, I don't know if it's more that like it's better identification because women, mothers are more secure than fathers mm, in terms yeah, of identification. Like yeah. if you really need to get this right. Yeah. But I don't know. It's mm -hmm. it's just an interesting feature because, you know, of course, we have these cursed tablets, but we don't have anyone explaining right. why things are as they are. So we have to, we have to reconstruct that. Is there any... I don't know what the evidence, how you get the evidence for this, but one could imagine a situation in which magic was more used by women yeah. in any case, just because they men don't have, have access to as much religion and power and power. That's yeah. what I was going to say is that men could, could have resource to actual, uh, you know, mm -hmm. legal means of getting think, what they want. I think that's hard to tell. I mean, women are certainly accused of magic much more than men. And right. I think that that is part of it. Magic is not only associated with women in the ancient world any more than it is in the medieval world, but mm. it is often associated with women. Most witches are women, that sort of thing. Right. And I think it has to do with that power dynamic. Things like curse tablets, it's going to be a little hard because in order to do a curse tablet, you have to have some resources right. and you have to have a certain amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. So that is going to rule, you know, the most powerless people can't even do that. That doesn't right. mean they're not doing magic. But the kind that is durable enough for us to see. Lead isn't cheap. You know, it's, I mean, it's pretty cheap, but it's not mm -hmm. nothing. And you, as you say, literacy and, you know, so the sorts of things that we're going to be able to track are going to be restricted somewhat in terms of who can do it. So right. I think that it, it becomes hard to tell. Um, just to give you a couple other types. So those are cursed tablets. Sure. But then there's the great magical papyrus or the, the various magical papyri. And so I'll just give you a couple of these and then I'll leave it at that. Here's a spell that is both words and deeds. Take wax or clay from a potter's wheel and shape it into two figures, one male and one female. Make the male look like Ares in arms. He should hold a sword in his left hand and point it at her right collarbone. Her arms must be tied behind her back and she must kneel. Attach the magic substance to her head or neck. On the head of the figure representing the woman whom you wish to attract... Right? Magical words. And then, so these are things that are missing. List of other body parts, including the, or, or missing from this version that I've got here. List of other body parts, including the genitals on which magical words must be written. Take 13 iron needles, stick one into her brain and say, I prick your brain, X, X being her name. List of other parts of the body to be pricked each time the magician has to say, I prick this part of the body of X to make sure that she think of no one but me, Y. Right. So do it over and over again with every body part with a needle. Take a lead plate and write the same formula on it and tie it to the figure in 365 knots with thread from a loom and recite the Abra Sax hold tight formula, which, you know, and deposit this at sunset near the tomb of someone who died before his time or died a violent death with flowers of the season. The spell that must be written and recited is this. I deposit this binding spell with you, gods of the underworld, 
magical words. And the Kore, Persephone, Erestigal, and Adonis, the magical words. Hermes of the Underworld, Tooth, magical words. This, all those right. are these nonsense words. And powerful Anubis, who holds the keys of those in Hades, the gods and demons of the Underworld, those who died before their time, male and female, youths and maidens, year after year, month after month, day after day, hour after hour. I conjure all the demons at this place to assist this one demon. Wake up for me, whoever you are, male or female, and go to every place, to every street, into every house, and fetch and bind. Bring me X, the daughter of Z, whose magical substance you have, and make her love me, Y, the son of A. Let her not have intercourse, neither from front nor from behind, and let her have not have pleasure with any other man except me, Y. Let her, X, not eat, not drink, not love, not be strong, not be healthy, not sleep, except with me, X, because I conjure you in the name of the terrifying one, the horrifying one. When the earth hears its name, his name it will open up. When the demons hear his awful name, they will be afraid. When rivers and rocks hear his name, they will burst. I conjure you, demon of the dead. Yes, drag her by her hair, her entrails, her genitals to me. Why? In every hour of time, day and night, until she comes to me. Why? And remains inseparable from me. Do this, bind her during my whole life to me, and force her, X, to be my slave, the slave of Y, and let her not leave me for a single hour of time. If you fulfill this wish, I will let you rest at once. For I am Adonai, Lord of magical words, who hides the stars, the brightly radiating ruler of the sky, the Lord of the world. Fetch her, tie her, make her love and desire me. Why? Because I, I conjure you, demon of the dead, by the terrible, the mighty one, magical words, to make you fetch X and make her join head to head, lips to lips, body to body, thighs to thighs, black to black, and do her job of making love with me forever and ever. And it goes on. Wow. Yeah. So that's just to give you a taste. Like these are not mild. Mm. <laughs> and again, that's very violent, but it's there's maybe more violence in the male ones, but there's there's ones like that that are flipped around that are women to men with violence as well. So the violence is not there's there's work being done right now on that issue of like is there gender are these gender specific? Is it gendered violence that is sometimes flipped? Or is it the violence that is magic? Is mm -hmm. is magic violence? Right. You know, and is this is this an understanding of what sexual attraction is in general? I mean, sexual attraction is certainly figured as violent in the ancient world very often. Hmm. You know, as as being an overpowering madness that causes you to be attracted to somebody else. So you know, they're, they're disturbing. Hmm. Um, and those we've found images like those images described as the wax images or hmm. or clay images with that are bound and with you know pins in them and things like that and they they're they are violent and they are disturbing but understanding exactly what's going on is not as obvious as it might seem like oh well this is obviously just a bunch of men being violent about women it's not quite that clear hmm. that's not to say it isn't <laughs> but but it isn't only that right put it that way anyway there's some spells for you <laughs> Not to be used at home. No, do not use these at home. Do not even, yeah, <laughs> just don't think about them. Harry Potter has nothing on these, is what I'm saying. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the about magic in the Chinese world, about Wu. Oh, yes. <laughs> not wooing, but Wu. Oh, woo. Yes. <laughs> So, you know, as I said, the word magush, uh, in addition to being, well, it was barred into Greek, as we saw, uh, but in addition to being barred into Greek, uh, it also made its way into a number of other languages. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Talmudic Hebrew word magosh and the Aramaic word amgusha, mm -hmm. meaning magician, mm -hmm. uh, and the Chaldean word uh, magdim, meaning wisdom and philosophy. Hmm. Okay. So a bit more of a positive yeah. Yeah. idea there. But one of the most surprising borrowings of this word, uh, magush, is into Chinese. Yes. Into yes. that word, wu. That is really cool. <laughs> so it's been proposed, anyways, that uh, it uh, the proto-Semitic root, and again, I'm not entirely sure how this is pronounced, <laughs> but... Myog, okay, which later becomes Wu. So that's that's quite a uh, that's a lot of phonetic phonological change, yeah, change yeah. that happens there. But that that much is already established by already studied sound changes okay. in the Sinitic languages. 
And so that, that word Wu is the, the Mandarin form mm -hmm. that may have come from the, uh, from old Persian Magush. Hmm. So Wu no is normally translated as shaman, mm -hmm. actually. And the Wu were responsible for such things as divination, astrology, prayer, sacrifice, and healing, mm -hmm. uh, and might be better thought of as magicians or mages rather than shaman, as we understand the term shaman. Right. Yeah, that, there's a whole set of complex overlapping mm -hmm. things to those terms. Okay. Shamans, on the other hand, originally come from the sort of Siberian and uh, Ural Altaic traditions mm. um, and are associated with altered states of consciousness and ecstatic trances. Yeah. Rather yeah, than that kind of yeah. more practical and, form of magic where mm -hmm. you, you know, do spells or astrology or whatever. Right. And the word shaman comes into English through German and Russian, uh, but ultimately from uh, a Tunguzian word. Uh, so what, what's Tunguzian? Well, again, it's from this, this world of Siberian and uh, okay, okay. That, that sort of northern... Right. I just don't know. The, is that... Do you think it's near Tunguska, where the, that Ooh, uh, big meteor fell? The meteor fell? Yeah, I don't that's know. That's the only <laughs> association I have with that word. Okay. Well, the word is, and again... Not sure about the pronunciation, uh, but Saman, or it could be Shaman, I'm not sure. Okay. Which might come up from a root that means to know. Well, that make, would make sense. Yes, yeah, that would yeah. make sense. You know, we've seen that with the, the wise wizard connection. Yeah. Right? Someone yeah, who, is, yeah. who, knows who knows things, things. is wise. Yeah, well, and who yeah. knows the unknown, right? Who knows the yeah. unknown. So... An interesting side note here, though, I mean, if that's not interesting enough, that a word makes I think it from it's Persian very cool. into Chinese, yeah, yeah. is that there's another Mandarin word, wu, basically mm -hmm. a homophone, though there may be some... There may be pitch differences, Maybe yeah. some pitch difference, but... Which means martial or military. Hmm. Right. And... It comes from a very phonologically similar proto synodic root, myag, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> but what's really interesting here is that the proto Indo European root mag, which mm -hmm. mean, meant, means to, to be able to have power that we saw that lies behind magush, the, that root, mm -hmm. it ha also has a homophone that means to fight. Hmm. Okay. So I think there might be some sort of relationship here, right? These there's some kind of deeper connection between these two words. So it's the, almost the like it's being calc or something. Not exactly. Well, that they they that it got borrowed at an early enough point where they were still well, they were still together, and then together. they both took the same journey mm -hmm. separately. Huh. Maybe it's that, or maybe it's something else. But but I mean, but it's just an interesting, just an interesting point of parallel there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so far from any having any competency <laughs> to comment on that, but that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So this second Proto-Indo-European root, that is a homophone or mm -hmm. the, the magic root. It, I mean, it is through Greek the source of a few fairly rare words in English, mm -hmm. but there, you know, knowing Greek, you will you will know this root. It, the maki. Mm, words, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Yeah. So words like naumaki, yeah. if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, naumaki, yeah. I mean, naumakia. I only know it in Greek, naumakia. Yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the uh, and the Amazonomaki, yeah. and the Kentoromaki, and the Gigantomaki, yeah. all of which mean the battle with the thing at the first part of the word. Yeah. So, so <laughs> a naumaki is a place constructed for mock sea battles. Oh, in English. In English. All right. Yeah. Okay. And logomachy is a contention about words, an argument about words. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and a duomachy is a fight between two people, a duel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in Greek, all those words I was saying, like the kenteromachy is the battle with the centaurs, and yeah. the gigantomachy is the battle with the giants, and mm -hmm. there's a ton, ton of words like that. Yeah. And the, the, what is it, the psychomachia mm -hmm. Oh, that's a text. That's yeah, a that's early text Christian. Of, early Christian, where the battle for the soul. Yeah. So the, that, that whole family of words comes from that, that sound-alike mm -hmm. root. Right. It might also be the root of the word Amazon. So that's interesting that there's an amazon -omaki. Yeah, that's when, because the, the, the Theseus fighting against the Amazons usually, but there's also, right. Heracles also fights the Amazons. Right. Yeah. 
recreation of the myths. Yeah. There can be recreations, but when I'm talking about the Gigantomachia or whatever, I mean that when they're talking about the myth. Oh, the actual so myth like, itself. So, right? for instance, okay. the, the, um, the Parthenon in Athens has depictions of the Gigantomachy uh, on, one okay. pedi- right. on one pediment, and it has um, the Amazonomachy on another one. Okay. So it has the depictions of the actual stories. Yeah. Myth yeah. Battles. yeah. Now, there could be. A Naumachia is a... a sea battle and then it, it later becomes a depiction of a sea battle right. like um recreation in a in a, a for a fake one or whatever so it's they, they could be used that way but all the ones i was listing off are like the for description the of the actual one right. in the myth okay the actual one mark yes the right. actual, actual one, one. <laughs> in myth yes <laughs> so yeah the word amazon uh that that society of female warriors in greek myth or how, mm-hmm. however you want to uh classify i don't even it. know anymore so there, there was a Greek folk etymology in the ancient world mm-hmm. for this word that Amazon comes from Greek, the Greek negative prefix a, mm-hmm. uh, and meaning you know not or whatever um, without yeah without, and mazos which means breast, in the belief that Amazons cut one of their breasts off in order to use you know bow and arrow, right more easily. Mm-hmm. This is probably a folk etymology. This is not really where it comes from. Mm-hmm. It more likely comes from a hypothetical Iranian compound, ha maz an, which means fighting together. Mm-hmm. So one mm-hmm. fighting together in a group. Right. So the Amazon's a group of warriors, basically. Mm-hmm. And that ha part uh, of this comes from the Proto-Indo-European root sem, which means one as one together with. Mm-hmm. It's like the, uh, in, in Latin, the reflexive. Se. Se, or mm-hmm. whatever. And interestingly, as a little side note, mm-hmm. that that root, Sam, uh, is one of the possible roots that lies behind the Irish Halloween forerunner or whatever, Samhain. Samhain, right. Which is an Irish festival that may have led to Halloween. And by the way, uh, speaking of the word Amazon, mm-hmm. the Amazon River was given this name because of the expedition of the Spanish explorer Francisco de uh, Orellana, Mm -hmm. which was attacked while on that river Mm -hmm. uh, by warriors that that he took to be women on account of their long hair. Right. Um, I mean, it was probably a pretty stressful time when he was being attacked. attacked. One can imagine that he didn't spend a lot of time like... Noticing their gender or anything. Identifying body parts, right? Right. Mm. And maybe he thought they were didn't they didn't have their breasts because they'd been cut off. Yeah, you never know. That's why they're Amazons. And furthermore, mm-hmm. Jeff Bezos, Bezos or Bezos? I never know. <laughs> Bezos. Let's I don't feel that. like we need to give him the courtesy of knowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, he named his online book company Amazon.com. Yeah. After that, the river specifically, mm-hmm. not after not the warriors, the warriors. Yeah. because it was simply because it was an exotic sounding thing, mm-hmm. uh, but also because it's the longest river in the world and he wanted his company to be Big. the biggest book company in the world. And more practically, because it started with the letter A. So in any alphabetization, it, it would, would turn up early. early. Mm-hmm. But And for the younger members of our audience, alphabetization is an archaic organizational system in which words are organized according to the first letter of their of the word. <laughs> this was very... particularly useful in things like phone, phone books, books yeah. which were an exciting mid-20th century innovation, <laughs> as well as things like indices and old-fashioned websites, which did once upon a time... List results in alphabetical you order. Very patronizing. <laughs> it's more that it's it, like it. It occurs to me every so often that they don't realize. That, well, why well, but like that also we don't use know that that alphabetization enough. isn't like to me. It just is a fundamental organizational mm-hmm. principle of the universe. But of course, it's not. It's just mm-hmm. as arbitrary as anything else. And in fact, how many times do you actually encounter alphabetized lists other than? In like roll calls mm. now, I mean, obviously people do know about alphabetization. I'm not being, but it just, mm-hmm. you know, it seems obvious to me, you say, because so it would turn up first in search, you know, in, in, on a list. Mm-hmm. But in fact, when you think of it as an online thing, right now, what does, does it matter it to have a, for, an A doesn't get you anything search anymore? results aren't 
that's not how things are ever listed, point. essentially. Yeah. So it's anymore, anyways. I mean, they may. No, no, and I think they were earlier. when when he yeah when he that's why remember. what I mean mm-hmm. like the, no it was like way way back before you had Google certainly and before you had things like an algorithm to put yeah. things in no exactly when you did it when you did a search and there wasn't that much out there it did come back to you in alphabetical order mm-hmm. so it did matter once mm-hmm. right so yes I, I know it sounded silly but it is actually a point that <laughs> alphabetization mattered then briefly for online stuff and now doesn't so it's kind of a quaint little yeah. trivia sure. piece now sure. <laughs> anyway please continue well i was just going to say that uh, despite jeff bezos's obvious success he is no ma- magician he's just very flexible in the ethical department <laughs> yes well so let's not let's not attribute any of that success to magic no <laughs> now virgil I mentioned mm. Virgil. Would you like to tell us a bit more about Virgil? Right. Well, I don't want to keep us too long, but I will say you talked about uh, how so, you know how he became mm-hmm. considered a magician. Right. And obviously, or maybe not obviously, but in the ancient world, there is nothing of that. Right. There's no. There's no treatment of Virgil like he's magical. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing in his actual biography. There's nothing in his later reception in the first couple of centuries that would suggest that. However, beyond what you mentioned in the video, um, as as part of the reason why this happens, there's one other piece. So Dido in book four, and then uh, uses magic in the Aeneid, written by Virgil. And then in book six, there's all the stuff in the underworld, which sort of purports to show an understanding of those forbidden things. And then the supposed Messiah. Bit. And then there's the supposed Messiah in Eclogue 4. So the Eclogues, a uh, series of moderately sh- moderate length to short poems um, about a number of things, but mostly about love. But number four uh, mm-hmm. prophesies the coming of a miraculous boy child who will be born soon and will bring a golden age right. and renewed hope and peace. No, uh, eternity of peace and uh, you know he writes this in the what is it the 30s bc and then lo and behold who's born 30 years later (laughs) right so to later christians right the understand the idea that it was prophetic of that he he didn't know what he was saying but he somehow understood that christ was coming you can see why that makes him seem magical but there's one other thing that you didn't mention that i just thought i would point to just because again it takes us back to witches and to uh, magic he ha- also another eclogue so another one in that same collection of poems is eclogue 8 and it is a poem that is basically a depiction of somebody doing love magic to try to bring someone back to her so it's an adaptation of a poem by Theocritus, who was a Greek writer earlier, who also has a magic poem. Okay. So a lot of the eclogues are adaptations of these earlier Greek poems. And so we've got dolls of clay and wax again. So that should remind us. So here's where we have a very literary depiction of magic that nonetheless agrees with mm-hmm. our subliterary and documentary evidence. Right. So it's kind of neat. There's also a werewolf theme. There's a happy ending. That the, so the person so this is Simitha is the main character, and she's trying to get Daphnis, a young man who has gone off with someone else, to come back to her. And there's a refrain in the poem, which kind of suggests the chant and formulaic nature of of poetry. So I'll read just a little bit of it. I won't read too much. Bring water, tie a soft fillet around this altar, and burn on it fresh twigs and male frankincense that I may succeed in turning my lover from sanity to madness by magic rites. All we need now is songs. Draw home from the city, my songs. Draw Daphnis home. Songs can even draw the moon from heaven. By songs, Circe transformed Odysseus's men. By singing, the cold snake in the meadow bursts. Draw home from the city, my songs. Draw home. Draw Daphnis home. To begin with, I shall twine around you three strands composed of three threads, each of a different color, and three times I shall carry your image around the altar. The divinity likes the odd number. Draw home from the city, my songs. Draw Daphnis home goes on uh, the magic often has is the ideas of sympathetic magic is very important in, in a lot of magical practices right. so we have as this clay growth gets hard and as this wax gets soft in one in the same fire so may daphnis from love of me sprinkle barley meal and kindle the fragile laurel twigs with pitch cruel daphnis makes me burn i burn this laurel for daphnis 
And just because we are close on Halloween, I'll just read the bit about the werewolf. Moiris himself gave me these herbs and poisons gathered near the Black Sea. I have often seen Moiris turn into a wolf by their power and hide in the mm. forest, and often seen him conjure up souls from the depth of their tombs and move to other fields the crops that had been sown. Draw home from the city, my songs, draw Daphnis home. And then it keeps going. And then, look, the embers on the altar have caught all by themselves with the flickering fire while I was slow to fetch them. Let this be a good sign. It must mean something. And Hylax is barking in the doorway. May we believe it? Or do lo lovers make up dreams for themselves? Spare him my songs. Daphnis is coming from the city. Spare him my songs. So it works. So I'm not saying that that one, I don't think that's that's Eclog 8. I don't know that it's as important as Eclog 4 right. in the conception of him as a ma magician. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there we have a poem that's a spell mm -hmm. and a depiction of magic. So I think that those are those kinds of elements really played into turning this weird legend <laughs> um, into Virgil the Magician. Cool. Well, I mentioned this tradition of weird stories, <laughs> and I want to sort of tell one, briefly tell one of these stories. <laughs> so this is the, the, the medieval story about Virgil in his basket. So Virgil was in love with a beautiful woman, and he arranges for a tryst with her that night, whereby he is to climb into a basket lowered from her window and be hauled up. To secretly to, enter right, her home right. and sleep with her. And as we should say, this is a story told in the Middle Ages. It has no yes. classical precedent or antecedent yeah, at all. This, yeah. this didn't actually happen. No. <laughs> only she plays a trick on him, and he is only halt, pulled up halfway, leaving him trapped. He can't jump down because it's too far, but he can't get into her room. And so the next morning, he's still there and is the subject of ridicule. Hooray! <laughs> However... Virgil uses his magic to get revenge by transferring all the fire of Rome to his erstwhile love interests, um, nether regions, shall we say? Uh, I'm remembering the picture mm -hmm. that I found for you for this. this. We'll, we'll include. <laughs> oh, I'll write that down. Include the horrifying <laughs> picture. Uh, so <laughs> where from all the lanterns in the city had to be lit. And so that picture is all the people la lighting their lantern from her nether regions. Her flaming nether regions. Yes. Now, this story is uh, not just sort of an isolated thing. It's actually part of a larger trope of wise or powerful men being tricked by wily women. And humiliated. And, hum and humiliated, showing the dangers of female attractiveness and cunning. Yeah. And so there's a similar story uh, in the medieval tale of the Greek philosopher Aristotle telling his pupil, the young Alexander the Great, and it is true that Aristotle was the tutor, tutor the yeah. tutor of Alexander the Great, the Great mm -hmm. but this particular lesson never actually happened, mm -hmm. warning him against the dangers of alluring women and telling him to avoid the king's seductive mistress, Phyllis. Right. However... Aristotle himself was nonetheless bewitched by her, and she manipulated him into allowing her to play the role of dominatrix and to ride on his back like a horse. And there are numerous artistic I, depictions like, of this. Astonishingly <laughs> numerous. I went and found some for you, and I was spoiled for choice. There's yeah. like hundreds of them. They love this story. Oh my goodness. Of him, of her... Him with a sort of bridle on yeah. and hers and on his back. I mean, I, I think it's just the allure of a dominatrix in general. <laughs> well, I guess it's just a very funny picture, and funny. too. Yes. And, and yeah, I mean, it's all about the inversion. The inversion. Yeah. yeah. So Alexander, having been told that this was going to happen by Phyllis, witnessed that he sort of was hiding and was able to see this all happen. So, in fact, he did, did learn, learn the, the lesson. lesson. Yes. Uh, so I would I would uh, suggest that her pedagogical technique is superior to Aristotle's because I think that's a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to forget. He's not going to forget. Unless he was really playing three dimensional chess chess and that's why he gave in to her oh, so that Aris so, uh, so that uh, yeah, Alexander yeah. would see come on Mark it's <laughs> got to be the man who was smarter so this trope 
you know, as like as we kind of just said, uh, is not only found in stories but in paintings and mm-hmm. so forth. And not not just that particular story, but other kind of examples of that trope. So as depicted by the many depictions of the Old Testament story of Judith saving her people by seducing her way into the tent of the Assyrian general Holofernes. Wow, well, that's yeah. I mean, I, that's the Latinized <laughs> version, I think. Yeah. Anyway, and beheading him. Now you say that's the Old Testament. That's Judith is is a. It's an apocryphal. Yeah. So. So it's not in all. Uh, I think it's accepted. Yeah. An so, accepted Jewish text, but it is not accepted by all Christians. Right. Sects. Yeah. Sects. I just know it's not in the King James. That's all. And I'm not even sure if it's accepted by all Jewish Jewish people versions either. of them. Yeah, I, I don't know. So. But it, it became a popular subject mm-hmm. in the Middle Ages and, mm-hmm. and beyond. Yep. So there are lots of paintings. Lots of pictures and, of that too, yes. Yeah. So we'll maybe include a picture of that. We'll put some pictures in. So this trope, which is uh, referred to by scholars sometimes as the power of women tapas, doesn't always involve women using their sexuality to gain power, but just sort of more generally depicts the inversion of traditional patriarchal power. Now in that Judith's story, she does use her sexuality to gain access to yeah. the camp the of tent, the king, yeah. the tent. But in other examples, so here's here's a, a an example from a historical story, whether mm-hmm. or not it's true or not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's from Herodotus, it's from so it's Herodotus. gotta be true. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us back to the Achaemenid Empire and the Magi mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. forth the original magicians, as it were. In this story, uh, Cyrus the Great, this story is of Cyrus the Great's death. So his army was defeated by the army of the, and I hope I'm going to pronounce this one correctly, uh, Masagetai. Yeah, Masagetai, yeah. Whose queen, Tamiris, Tamiris probably, took revenge for the death of her son by having Cyrus's corpse beheaded and then crucified with the head stuffed into a wineskin filled with human blood, saying, according to Herodotus, I warned you that I would quench your thirst for blood, and so I shall. That's some pretty kick-ass. It's a a good story. (laughs) It's a good story. I'm not going to deny that. (laughs) Yeah. And there are also a number of pictures of that for the Middle Ages. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Which are really grody because they're like her with sticking a head in a sack of blood. (laughs) So if you think about it. Mm. (laughs) So I think we'll end off with one last thing Mm -hmm. uh, about the world of Wicca, which you mentioned mentioned the etymology of. So Wicca comes from that masculine form of the word witch, Mm -hmm. uh, but disappeared from the language only to be later adopted to refer to neo-paganism. So again, I want to stress right. the point that this this word did not have a it disappeared from the language, and it was kind of it re-adopted. was intentionally and consciously yeah. readopted. Yeah, and uh, we even know who revived the word. Uh, it seems to have been revived by revived from the dead, if you will. Uh, <laughs> if I will, I don't know if I will. <laughs> I don't know. By Gerald Gardner in 1957. He also, by the way, introduced the use of wands into Wicca and neo-paganism. Right, right. Which, again, it's not like he made up the idea of wands. No, but but it's not an unbroken tradition. Yeah. He kind of yeah. read it in books and stuck it back in. Anyways, he, uh, in doing this, was influenced by the writings of his contemporary, the eccentric Aleister Crowley, mm-hmm. who was labeled the wickedest man in the world by the British press who, for his part, prepared an edition of the 17th century grimoire, which you now know Mm -hmm. the meaning of, a magic book, uh, focusing on demonology under the title The Book of the Goatea, or sorry, Goatea, of Mm -hmm. Solomon the King, Mm -hmm. uh, with a modern revival of one of the old Greek terms from magic, Goatea, and also reintroduced the archaic spelling of magic with a K. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So he's... he's CK, yeah. CK, yeah. So he's borrowing all these old words and mm-hmm. giving them new life. Yeah. And I will point out that one of the key elements of magic versus religion in the ancient world is the exoticization, yeah, right? That right. Ma- magic is the same actions often, really. Like when mm-hmm. you read some of the spells, yeah, they get violent or whatever. But basically, I call on so-and-so by such and such a name to do such and such. I burn an offering, you know, that's religion. Mm -hmm. But 
it has the exotic elements of faraway lands and stuff. Right. And I think, you know, you see that yeah. in this in this construction mm-hmm. of oh, something more... that is is not quite religion because yeah. now we're going to, you know, call it by magic with a K, not with yeah, just with, C yeah. and give it all these it's exotic all the more elements. more exotic by using different spellings yeah. or using these old words that yeah. have disappeared. Yeah. And so a lot of these neo-pagan ideas were invented really in the early 20th century Mm -hmm. from a sort of imagined witch cult uh, of the medieval and early modern periods and were supposedly actually holdovers from pre-Christian religion that had somehow managed to survive uh, into a much later period. Right. There's... So, the, the, I mean, there's no, or not much anyway, solid historical evidence to support this kind of hypothesis. It it did seem to kind of die out and then... Right, and then be re, mm-hmm. reintroduced in from, from essentially from literary evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Though it is true that in the Middle Ages and in the early modern period, the authorities at the time imagined a kind of conspiratorial witchcraft. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is, it may not be a true belief, but it was you know, an untrue belief that went back yeah, a yeah, long way. Yeah. These sort of diabolical sects who gathered to worship demons and perform gruesome rites and even ha- <clears throat> have sexual intercourse with the devil. Yeah. They believed that was going on at the time. Yes. The, yeah. So it's a belief. It may, may never <laughs> have happened, but it is definitely a belief that goes back a ways. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But again, there's not a lot of evidence for these practices actually occurring in the Middle Ages. Right. But just as a sort of final note, it is worth noting that uh, in a Gallup poll from the early 2000s, more than 20% of Americans believe in witches, 25% in astrology, more than 40% in demonic possession, and in total, nearly three quarters in some kind of paranormal activity. Mm -hmm. We can compare this with only half who believe in evolution. Hmm. So it's perhaps a reminder to be more skeptical. Or to at, at least check your sources. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are things, you know, that I've argued before that, that science can't answer because, it you know, if it has a proposition that is not falsifiable, science can do nothing. Mm-hmm. But the point here, it's not, let's not, let's not. At the very end of this podcast, get into the question of whether or not yes, the supernatural yeah. is real in any way or whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you're looking for things like knowing that Wicca comes out of this literary tradition. That's something we can... That's something you know. Now, know. whether that means that there's no such thing as the supernatural or witches or whatever, that's, that's, that's not a, that's a separate question. issue. That's but a different yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, and, and the same with religion, right? Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Just know what's actually true. In terms of where things come from and where they were made up by and or yeah, exactly. All right. Well, <laughs> on that note, um, shall we wish everyone a happy Halloween? Indeed. However you are or are not observing the day. Have a magical time. <laughs> or at least a sugar fueled one. Mm-hmm. And or, you know, hide inside and turn off all the lights and Make sure nobody thinks you're home and you'll be fine. (laughs) Whatever approach you take to Halloween. Or if you're elsewhere than North America, maybe nothing. (laughs) But anyway, um, yeah, happy Halloween and we'll talk to you soon. You will soon hear us in the past talking to Scott about um, sound education. Yes. Bye-bye. Happy Halloween. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.